The largest ocean on our planet could soon be the site of the next big mining boom. Across the Pacific, resource companies and island nations are scouring the deep seas for vast untapped minerals. Metals that could power green energy and reduce the world's reliance on fossil fuels. We're a country that's been blessed with this wealth that sits in our ocean. It's no good sitting on the surface and being afraid of the unknown and not willing to go down and find out. Home to one of the world's largest marine sanctuaries, the Cook Islands is considering deep sea mining in its pristine waters. The tiny Pacific nation hopes it'll bring jobs and wealth to a region grappling with climate change. But environmentalists fear ocean mining will harm a delicate underwater ecosystem that scientists know little about. Our ocean cannot handle this. I really do not feel like the technology is there at all to be even considering doing this in a sustainable fashion. It doesn't make sense to me to solve uh, an environmental issue by creating a new environmental issue. 101 East investigates how deep sea mining is dividing the Pacific. Whether you want to lounge on golden beaches or enjoy the crystal clear water, the Cook Islands is a dream destination. Located between New Zealand and the United States, it's a popular stop off for cruise liners traversing the Pacific Ocean. Fantastic. Tourism is the main money spinner for this nation of 15,000 people. But the Cook Islands wants to be a pioneer of a very different industry. Deep sea mining. At the main port, islanders are blessing a boat that could bring unparalleled wealth to the nation. Owned by resource company Moana Minerals, the research vessel will explore the deep sea, the metals critical to the green energy transition. Our ocean connects us, it sustains us, it supports us. We will protect it, we will harvest it. In 2022, Prime Minister Mark Brown's government awarded underwater exploration licences to three resource companies, including Moana Minerals. Over the last 10 years, we've been preparing our laws, our regulatory authorities, our, our agencies, towards building a sustainable and responsible seabed sector for the benefit of our Cook Islands people. As the rope is cut, they unveil the name of the boat, which translates to Rainbow Ocean. There's no breaking of champagne bottles here. The ship is blessed with an eco-friendly option, a coconut. <laughs> the Prime Minister is optimistic about his nation's new direction. While driving into the wharf this morning, I saw the cruise liner outside, and that ship represents our current prosperity with tourism. This vessel here represents our future prosperity with our minerals program. Um, so it's, it was a poignant day coming in and seeing these two different vessels and what they represent to our country. We're on a journey of discovery. We see our country as being a leader of this particular industry. Just listening to those speeches this morning, there was a lot of talk about protecting the ocean, but also harvesting the minerals. I just wonder, is it really possible to do both? The next day, I'm going to get a glimpse at how deep sea mining could work. We've been granted exclusive access to the boat's maiden voyage. Three days at sea, here we go. 
The Prime Minister is also coming along for the ride. A team of 19 will be at sea for close to a month. Well, Lucy, here's your cabin. Awesome. Showing me the ropes is Moana Minerals CEO Hans Smith. This way to the galley. He's a former South African Navy engineer and diamond miner, now deep sea explorer. Is today the start of a new frontier of mining? Without a doubt. Uh, you know, the world is looking at going to green energy. It's looking at transitioning to alternate um, uh, sources of, of powering our various equipment. And in order to do that, we need critical minerals and critical metals. This is the start of unlocking the potential of these resources on the ocean. Today, Hans's team is dropping a probe into the water to calibrate the sonar equipment they'll be using to map the ocean floor. The exploration licence allows Moana Minerals to trial technology and take samples to work out how metals can be sustainably extracted. But it's not a green light to mine. With no guarantees, it's a risky five-year treasure hunt in one of the least explored places on Earth. We looked at spending, probably when we're done, probably 100, 200 million dollars of, of, um, of funds doing all of this initial work at risk. But should we prove that we can do it, and we can do it responsibly, we will make that money back and more. So our survey area is up here in our exploration license area. On the captain's bridge, Han shows me the company's exploration area, spanning 20,000 square kilometres. This pocket is less than 1% of the Cook Islands territory, but contains minerals worth up to $10 billion. In this region on the sea floor, uh, we estimate that there are roughly 500 million tonnes of these nodules laying on the sea floor. And within these nodules, we have predominantly uh, manganese, cobalt, nickel, copper, and then the rare earths. And these are laying on the ground. Just the polymetallic nodules sit five kilometres below on the ocean floor. It looks like a cobbled road with all these little nodules packed densely against one another uh, across this entire area. Unique little little uh, golden nuggets. Is this the gold or oil of the 21st century? I definitely think that these black nuggets are uh, going to be an essential part of our ability to transition to what we want to do at the end of the day. Without these, we are not going to be able to achieve our goals and objectives. You can see some good uh, good structure around here. The Moana Minerals team relies on sonar mapping to find the nodules. So that's still that gradual descent from the island as, as you're going down? Correct, yes. Hans is showing the Prime Minister what they're looking for. Flat, soft areas of the sea floor where the biggest deposits of nodules are found. These maps are, are invaluable for us in that regard, that we can see all the flat areas and that's where we can go and focus. Only 25% of the world's seafloor has been mapped and the Prime Minister says deep sea exploration is only possible with the help of large mining companies. What we're seeing now is like a, a spotlight being shined at the bottom of the ocean to see what it looks like, something that nobody's seen before. We wouldn't be in a position to acquire the skills, the capability, the technology to provide us with uh, this level of mapping uh, right around our islands. We just wouldn't have it. But critics say the bulk of scientific research is being done by mining companies and there's not enough independent analysis. The environmental data will be coming from your company and you obviously have a vested interest in mining. How can we be certain the data is independent? We are collecting the data and we have a vested interest in the data, absolutely. But as far as us tainting the data or the data being tainted, um, no, while doing all our work, we always have inspectors on board confirming that what we are doing is done transparently. The analysis is being done by the scientific community. It's not being done by our employees. The work is not being done by our people. Uh, we have uh, earmarked over the next two years to do 20 different scientific studies. 
each of those studies is uh, being done by eminent universities and, and scientists around the world. I think, if anything, uh, people should be thrilled about the fact that we are doing such good, thorough, um, impressive work. The Cook Islands isn't the only nation seeking this buried treasure. The search is underway across the entire Pacific Ocean. Three other island nations, Nauru, Kiribati and Tonga, are also considering deep sea mining. Working with Nauru, Canadian miner The Metals Company is much further along in its exploration. It plans to start mining in 2024 and is trialling a remote control machine that many deep sea mining companies will use to collect nodules. The technology is built to withstand the extreme pressure 5,000 metres below the surface. As it dredges the sea floor, it collects the nodules and sediment, pumping it back to the ship in a hydraulic operated pipe. On board, the nodules pass through a large sieve, the water and sediment is returned to the ocean and the rocks taken to land for processing. People assume it's really difficult, but it is fairly straightforward. And the best analogy to use is one of a vacuum cleaner, where you have the nozzle at the end of a pipe running across the floor, lifting the dirt off the floor and traveling up that pipe to the vacuum cleaner and being collected in the bag. That's the analogy I like to use to explain the process. Starting at the bottom of that process, you're essentially dredging along the sea floor and taking the hard substrate from the bottom of the ocean. Surely that'll have some effect. Of course, what we do has impact. That is a reality. What we need to do is we need to measure the extent of that impact and the harm that that impact has and look at whether that is acceptable in terms of what the payoff is. In other words, what we are getting back. We are literally just picking them up uh, and bringing them up to the surface. Harm is being done, but the harm is, is, uh, is manageable and is acceptable in context of the scale of what we are doing. But the technology is not foolproof. This undercover footage acquired by environmental group Greenpeace shows test dredging carried out by the metals company in the Pacific Ocean in 2022. The sediment should be going deep into the water. Instead, it's being discharged on the surface where the majority of marine life exists. An investigation by the authorities and international experts found no environmental harm was caused by the spill. An incident has been shown out of context and has been used to drive negative sentiment against our industry. And what were the metals company doing? They were out there with a prototype system, um, out there proving it and testing it. And as we know with prototype systems, um, this is you know, the first time and there are going to be problems that we encountered. And what happened with them was a piece of machinery um, had failed. The rest of the story that is not told is that the minute that was noticed, the operation stopped. And what they did was they went back to the footage and found out what caused the problem and fixed it. How much of a risk is a spill? Lucy, a spill is always a risk. You know, to, to sit here and say we'll never have a spill is, is, is untrue, we'll have a spill. Is this technology good enough or does there need to be some advancements? It's good enough to get us started. Once we've started and we've learned more and we have more knowledge, we will then start iterating. So we will then start learning our lessons, making adjustments and evolving the system. And we believe version 2.0, we will go back to the drawing board uh, and redesign and optimize what we did first time around. Sunday night's Italian night. Over pizza and pasta in the mess hall, I asked the Prime Minister why he wants his country to be the guinea pig of this industry, given the risks. As a Prime Minister, as a leader, do you have to be pragmatic when it comes to deep sea mining? Your pragmatism is, is by nature a necessity when you live in a small island state. Uh, we we're in a, a country that has uh, very limited resources. We have the diseconomies of scale that work against us in terms of getting what we want and what to achieve. So we have to be pragmatic. Uh, we have to make bold decisions sometimes. And we have to lead the way in order to get to where we want to go and not just follow the, uh, uh, the cries of other people. As the leader of our country, I have to look at all opportunities 
uh, that will enable our people to have good, comfortable lives. I think for everything that we do, there is uh, a risk, uh, and it's making an appropriate uh, judgment on what we consider to be uh, safe. But is the environmental harm caused by mining really manageable? That's hard to answer because scientists know very little about the deep sea. They estimate only 10% of marine life in the depths of the Pacific Ocean has been discovered. In New Zealand, the National Institute of Water and Atmospheric Research is home to some of the world's leading minds in marine science. Dr. Malcolm Clark is an expert in deep sea biology and has studied the impacts of underwater mining. As you can see, thousands upon thousands of, of specimens. Respected by conservationists and the mining industry for his pragmatic, no-nonsense approach, he's advised the Cook Islands on how best to conduct deep sea mining. Dr. Clark is also one of the few scientists who's ventured into the ocean abyss. Well, the deep sea is a very foreign environment as, as we see it. It's totally dark. It's also cold, around two degrees Celsius. These animals are highly adapted to, to those conditions. What you have among the many specimens sort of here are these worms that live among the nodules on the ocean floor. They're vital scavengers. Without them, the deep sea would be polluted with dead carcasses. The wriggling creatures are also key prey for larger animals in the Pacific Ocean's food chain. What's the effect when a deep sea nodule collector comes through? So these worms are going to get sucked up in the direct path of the collector. There's immediate physical damage and mortality. A lot of these animals only move very slowly. They can't get out of the way of a, of a collector machine, even, even if they know it's coming. Dr Clark says possibly the biggest threat to deep sea life are the underwater sandstorms whipped up during the dredging of the seabed. It can clog the, the feeding apparatus of animals that are living above the seafloor itself. And then when it settles back on the seafloor, depending on how deep it is, it can bury animals and also cap the previous sediment so that uh, oxygen, for example, might not be able to penetrate as easily as it could before. There's very little doubt there will be mortality caused by, by the sediment plume. The issue that scientists have to grapple with is trying to quantify how many of those animals are likely to die. The waters around the Cook Islands are an important breeding ground and migration route for humpback whales. Dr Clark is worried they could be affected by the loud clanging noise created when nodules are pumped to the surface through the steel pipe. Whales are well recognised as being quite sensitive to certain frequencies of noise and what is an excellent conductor of sound. So we're talking about that noise generated by the nodule collector, the riser pipe or the discharge pipe extending over thousands of kilometres distance in areas where they're spawning and migration routes where they're moving from their spawning grounds in the Pacific Islands, for example, down to the Antarctic waters for, for feeding. So it's going to be very important that we're not going to be generating noise in the frequency range that will completely mask the, the ability of animals to pick up their own interspecies communication. While the impact of ocean mining on marine life is largely unknown, Dr. Clark has studied seabeds where mining has been trialled and found recovery is minimal. The ability of the deep sea to recover appears to be very, very low. Studies 30 years after some initial disturbance show that components of the animal communities have not recovered. He says deep sea mining is viable if it's carefully managed, comparing the ocean floor to a rainforest. If we're wanting to cut down some forest to allow farming or horticulture, there's an impact. The key question for scientists is how much can we remove, how much impact can we have on that original forest before we start to affect the structure or the function? How much we can take is a very simple question, but a very difficult answer. Do we know enough about the deep sea environment to really understand the impact of deep sea mining? One of the management responses to uncertainty is to make sure we, we start small. 
we don't just suddenly say to a large number of contractors, go out there and fill your boots. Covering more than 70% of the Earth's surface, oceans play a key role in absorbing carbon emissions, but they face a raft of growing pressures. There's plastic pollution, um, there's overfishing, there's ocean acidification. If deep sea mining proceeds, um, it's just going to compound all these issues. It's why Jacqueline Evans believes the world should pause deep sea mining for a decade. She is one of 700 international scientists and marine policy experts who've signed a petition calling for a 10-year moratorium on extracting minerals from the ocean. Why did you do that? I think that it's a really good way to have an agreement between people that are supporting mining and people that are not supporting mining to just pause and collect the data to give us a better idea about the kind of impact that mining will have. Jacqueline is taking me out snorkelling to show me what she's so passionate about protecting. In 2019, the Cook Islander won the prestigious environmental award, the Goldman Prize. It recognised her grassroots campaign that led to the establishment of one of the world's largest marine reserves. Called the Marae Moana, it covers the entirety of the Cook Islands' domestic waters and prevents commercial fishing within 50 nautical miles of land. Our marine park is enormous. It goes way beyond the horizon. Uh, it's about five times the size of the state of California. And we have whales, we have turtles, we have seabirds, we have tuna, we have all kinds of marine animals here. In these pristine waters, the clarity is extraordinary. We swim amongst coral, fish and turtles. I just love it here. Um, I love the peacefulness of being underwater. She argues mining isn't the only path to prosperity and there's money to be made of a healthy ocean. The tourists, they come here to see um, clean, healthy coral reefs. It's really important for tourism, but also in terms of our um, subsistence fishing and uh, our our industrial fishing that we have, there's a lot of uh, economic benefit to having a beautiful, pristine environment. The marine park made the Cook Islands a leader in conservation. But with deep sea mining on the horizon, Jacqueline says the nation's reputation is at risk. We feel like the government's rushing into it. There's been a lot of government propaganda for deep sea mining in the Cook Islands. If deep sea mining proceeds, the marine park is pretty much not going to be taken seriously. I mean, already internationally, it's, uh, it's considered a, a disappointment because of the, the plans that the government has announced. In a small country where the government is the biggest employer, she says most people are afraid of speaking out against deep sea mining. Jacqueline claims her views meant she was forced to leave her position managing the marine park. Basically, it was because I had recommended that um, we, we adopt the 10-year moratorium. Among other concerns, she complained the government was relying solely on data provided by resource companies. We've been asking uh, for independent research to be done, but it just was not a um, popular suggestion. They felt that I wasn't on the same page as them, so um, they decided to let me go. I put her allegation to the Prime Minister. Was Jacqueline Evans fired because of her stance on deep sea mining? I believe uh, that position was advertised by the department head uh, and a new person more suitable uh, for the next phase of the marine park project was appointed uh, to take on the role of the manager of the Marae Moana office. Internationally, 700 marine scientists have signed a petition for a moratorium on deep sea mining. Should you be listening to what they're saying? Um, it's all very well for uh, people to jump on a bandwagon, if you like. Uh, but what we're hearing is, is more a rhetoric of fear rather than uh, statements of scientific understanding. What we want to do is base our decision-making on science, on data, on evidence. And the only way to do that is to 
carry out exploration in our, in our deep sea. If you're on a journey of discovery, is there not a need for a moratorium? Absolutely not. A moratorium would halt and slow down exploration initiatives. These journeys are not done uh, freely. They cost a lot of money to undergo exploration. We want to be able to understand our ocean ourselves. We don't want someone else to come and take that knowledge and understanding. We want to learn it ourselves. It's easy to sell the Cook Islands as a postcard paradise. But COVID-19 taught the Prime Minister a valuable lesson. He needs to diversify his country's tourism-reliant economy. When the pandemic hit in 2020, many of the resorts shut down. In a single year, the economy dropped by 25%. It was tough when COVID came. The first thing, of course, we did was close our borders. And essentially, we closed the borders for two years. That was very, very difficult on um, our industry and on, on the, the private sector in particular. COVID was definitely a wake-up call for us that we must diversify our economy. We don't know what the future holds in terms of uh, the tourism industry globally and regionally. Uh, so definitely for us, the need to diversify has taken on greater significance, much more importance, which is why our minerals industry is going to be so important for us in the future. It's not just dependence on tourism that worries the Prime Minister. Even before the pandemic, the Cook Islands economy was facing its fair share of challenges. In a country that's 99% water, agriculture is small scale. Like other Pacific nations, many young people head overseas seeking higher paid jobs to send money back home to their families. Four out of five Cook Islanders live and work in Australia or New Zealand. A sign of the exodus, abandoned houses in villages across the country. The Prime Minister says deep sea mining could bring social as well as financial benefits by providing jobs that will encourage the population to stay. People go where the money is. So currently, uh, many of our people, our children, our grandchildren, they've moved overseas to work in industries that pay them more money, such as in the horticultural industry in New Zealand, picking apples. Well, we refer to our minerals, these are our golden apples, and if developed properly, we have an opportunity for our people then to collect our own apples, which are sitting at the bottom of the ocean. With the resource wealth from deep sea mining, the Prime Minister has boldly claimed his small country could become the Dubai or Norway of the Pacific. We've got in place a uh, financial regime uh, which involves taxation, royalties uh, and so forth. And we are certainly looking at the establishment of a sovereign wealth fund. The Cook Islands has given out ocean exploration licences to three mining companies, which have all set up shop on the biggest island's main street. A sign this potential new industry could help this small South Pacific nation emerge from the doldrums. But there are economic risks. The Cook Islands isn't the first nation to try deep sea mining. In 2011, the Mexican government issued an exploration license to a resource company, but decided not to go ahead with a mining permit. It's now being sued for $2 billion in alleged losses of future profits. The company in that dispute, Odyssey, was denied a mining permit on the grounds its project could harm vital turtle habitat. However, a Mexican legal tribunal found the government's refusal was unlawful. Some locals fear a similar scenario here because Odyssey is a contractor and shareholder of CIC, one of the three beneficiaries of exploration licenses. An Odyssey spokesperson told 101 East it has no legal right to sue in the Cook Islands. But Jacqueline Evans, a prominent environmentalist, worries her nation is vulnerable. I'm very concerned because actually in the legislation there is no possibility to just decide not to issue a licence just because we changed our mind and decided to take up a different development option. Um, so we could potentially be sued for that. Are you worried if you don't go ahead with a mining permit that your government could be sued? 
I think our legislation has uh, safeguards that are in place in terms of our legislation, in terms of our regulations to ensure uh, that we are protected as a people. One of the things that we made sure that when we embarked on this journey that there are levels of protection, uh, both from a legal perspective, from an environmental perspective, but also from a financial perspective, that these measures are in place to ensure uh, that we operate as with good sound uh, regulatory uh, laws and regulations. If it's not feasible, if it's not viable, then it won't be done. Uh, it's as simple as that. Across the Pacific, people's livelihoods depend on a healthy marine environment. The threat to fisheries is a key reason why seven nations in the region vehemently oppose deep sea mining. But with the Cook Islands and three other Pacific countries in favour of mining, there are fears it could divide the region. There are already rifts in the Pacific Islands at the moment, so if we don't work with our neighbours that could be affected by this activity, I do see this as continuing. Rather than looking at the potential of creating a rift, I would encourage countries to respect the decisions that each country is going to make in regards to any resource in their own jurisdiction. Despite the risk of inflaming tensions, the Prime Minister believes deep sea mining could help Pacific nations boost their finances whilst tackling climate change. The region is one of the worst affected by global warming, battered by rising sea levels, droughts and cyclones. We have been at the front line of climate change for a number of years. While the world is trying to get our G20 countries to commit to reducing carbon emissions and reduce the impacts of climate change, we are already feeling that here, so we can do our part to help the world. Uh, these minerals uh, not only provide an opportunity uh, for income for our country, but it also provides uh, an opportunity for us to contribute to the world's push to uh, green energy and to reducing carbon emissions. We're doing them a favour, if you like. Australia has built its strong economy off the back of fossil fuels like coal. But in a push to curb climate change, it's one of the many nations who've committed to net zero carbon emissions by 2050. Two billion electric cars will be needed globally to meet that target. At this green energy festival in Sydney, there's a lot of interest in such vehicles. Deep sea mining companies say their industry is vital to build the batteries required to power these cars. The concerns are being raised at this event about sustainability of recycling minerals instead of plundering them. When you're talking about mining, you can only talk about making it as sustainable as practicable. Obviously, if you're taking virgin material from the ground uh, and making use of it the first time, you've got to have an extraction. Uh, we will reach the point where um, all of the materials that go into a battery are in fact recyclable. Many consumers here are wary of mining minerals from the deep sea. Do you think we need to go into the ocean for these minerals? I guess ultimately it's like, what is the ultimate environmental impact? I think not. I think we've done enough sort of on the earth alone without going sort of down into the oceans. I'd certainly wouldn't want to, you know, be buying cars that are going into, you know, more delicate environments. We probably need to dig it out of our own backyard first. Do you think we need to be going into the oceans to no, absolutely not. And if I knew that that's where the metal was coming from, that would 100% put me off buying that vehicle. What's it like to see all the interest in electric vehicles here today? It's very inspiring, actually. Martin Merrick is the national president of Volvo Group, the largest manufacturer of vehicles in Australia. His company, alongside BMW, Renault and Volkswagen, supports a 10-year moratorium on deep-sea mining. They have vowed not to use seabed minerals in their electric vehicles until their environmental concerns are met. There needs to be a deep understanding of the risks to the environment before we start any deep seabed mining. And our customers really want to know and care about where we source our material from. They want it done in a responsible way. Volvo Group believe they can meet consumer demand through recycling and land-based mining. 
Recycling is a key focus for Volvo Group. We've made really good progress in terms of recycling the materials and batteries today, and we actually have a, a, a battery cell uh, that has been produced with 100% recycled material. You know, it's not just the car industry that's thinking twice about deep sea mining. There's big tech, the likes of Microsoft, Google and Samsung. They've all said no to the mining of the world's oceans. Environmental campaigning globally has played a huge role in pushing corporations, consumers and investors to reject resource extraction from our oceans. We are facing what I would call an ocean emergency. We must take action and we must sustainably manage the ocean's resources for the good of humanity and the health of the planet. Since calls for a moratorium on mining began at the 2022 UN Oceans Conference in Portugal, a growing list of nations have backed those concerns. This includes major economies like Canada, Germany, Spain and France. La France soutient l'interdiction de toute exploitation des grands fonds marins. But Pacific nations who want deep sea mining are pushing back. Well, the, the G20 countries are responsible for 80% of carbon emissions globally. You know, I think it smacks a little bit of uh, a patronizing attitude to try and tell us that we should not be doing what we're doing because it may uh, damage the ocean environment. The carbon emissions of all the Pacific countries put together would amount to a matchstick in a forest fire. We're not the countries that put plastic into the ocean. We didn't acidify the ocean. And we're not one of those countries that have radioactive storage or exploded bombs in our ocean. So it is somewhat patronizing, I find, or even insulting su to suggest that we would cause damage to the ocean by what we are proposing to do. Now, Pacific nations who want deep sea mining are also demanding the right to mine in international waters beyond their territory. And they're taking that fight to the International Seabed Authority in Jamaica. This United Nations affiliated body regulates and licenses mining in international waters, effectively half of the planet's surface. The ISA has issued 31 exploration licenses to 22 companies to see if ocean mining is viable. Most of these permits are issued for a vast sea trench near the Cook Islands where the biggest known deposits are found. For a decade, the ISA has argued over rules needed to govern ocean mining. Now, that debate has come to a head. In 2021, the tiny Pacific nation of Nauru triggered a legal mechanism within the ISA that requires delegates to come up with a mining code within two years. If they can't agree by July 2023, the ISA will start assessing deep sea mining applications even without proper regulations or legal protections in place. Nauru and the metals company plan to start mining in the Pacific Ocean in 2024. It's a really understudied field and a, a very interesting... Marine law expert Dr Alina Jekyll is concerned at the lack of governance and monitoring to ensure deep sea mining is done safely. There is a lot of work to do to um, have a fully formed mining code. It is unclear at the moment who would ensure compliance within the ISA and who would undertake inspections. It is unclear what the um, financial regime would be, so it is unclear how much of any mining profits would have to be shared, and if so, with whom. All these questions are outstanding. Is that problematic? Up until recently, the only compliance mechanism has been self-reporting by the mining companies and states involved. Um, and that is obviously problematic given that we're talking about seabed mining far offshore, underwater, um, which is very difficult to monitor in the first place. Dr Jekyll has written a book and numerous papers about the ISA. She says it's a secretive organisation that rarely consults openly. I think it's fair to say that the ISA is not the most transparent organisation. Um, a lot of their decision making happens behind closed doors and that's despite the fact that states have repeatedly asked for more transparency. It doesn't align with um, global good governance standards, um, but decisions continue to be made behind closed doors by and large.
Dr Jekyll fears small nations who carry out deep sea mining, like the Cook Islands, could face catastrophic consequences. Under international law, these countries can be financially liable if a resource company causes a disaster on the ocean. The risk could be quite significant. Um, it would be significant for any country, but in particular for smaller economies, where of course the liability could make up a, a greater proportion of their GDP. While economic and environmental concerns have been front and centre in this debate, Dr Jekyll is concerned the social implications have been largely ignored. Under the ISA's rules, mining in international waters must benefit all of humanity. But she says there hasn't been enough transparent consultations with island communities. Because seabed mining is a high technology industry, um, there will be a lot of automation involved. So um, it's not assured that seabed mining would generate a lot of local jobs. Across the Cook Islands, weekly volleyball matches are much anticipated events that bring the community together. In this village on one of the country's smaller islands, I want to find out what locals think about deep sea mining, as they're the ones who will be vying for any jobs created. After going to a government information session, one woman thinks mining the ocean will benefit everyone. We will get so many benefits from it. The old age pension, the uh, child welfare, all those kind of things. But others are not so certain. To be honest, I don't know much about deep sea mining. Well, government sometimes, I don't believe them. Their words, sometimes they can break that words. I don't have enough information regarding the impact, the negative impact from the ocean when it's harvested. I'm still reading upon it, I'm still trying to find out what are the, 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 the pros and cons that's going to come out of this. Alana Smith wants her fellow islanders to understand the impacts of mining the ocean. She's the head of a local environmental NGO, Tia Bukhari. I would say seabed mining is a very foreign concept to our people. It's a, it's a real Western concept that our ancestors would be mind-blowing to even think about. To educate local communities, Alana travels to the far reaches of the 15 islands that make up this country. The 30-year-old represented the Cook Islands in the Miss World competition, a public profile that she uses to teach them about the possible dangers of deep sea mining. I feel there's been a big push in terms of what the economic benefits would be from mining and little attention has been brought to what the potential environmental impacts will be. So there's been an imbalance in this information being presented to our people. The end goal for us is that our people are informed of both sides and, it, and they're able to make an informed decision based on both sides being given to them. We need to put in the time and effort to keeping our people up to speed with what really is going on. Who's heard of climate change? Much of Alana's work is in local schools, educating children who will benefit from or bear the brunt of deep sea mining. With a PowerPoint project, she's explaining the potential ramifications of mining the ocean. So I'm going to talk a bit more about this new industry that the Cook Islands might be looking into, and that is deep sea mining. So who's heard of deep sea mining? Yep, a few of you guys. All right. So what will these guys be mining for? Anybody want to take a guess? Nodules, awesome, yes. These rocks are filled with metals, metals that help fuel electric vehicles. They take 10 million years to form, just one. So it's not like we can harvest these rocks and they will grow back the next year. It's taken a long time to form. Why do you come here to these schools? Well, schools are a great avenue to start with for information because um, our kids are like sponges. They take in information, they, they want to understand more about it, and then they actually start discussions back in their household, asking mum and dad, you know, what are your thoughts on this? And, you know, you'd hope that that discussion will then trickle down into the wider community so you've got an island-wide um, discussion on the issue. 
It's important for people to ask questions and to be aware because this will impact us as Cook Island people. Um, these are our resources, this is our environment that we rely on for our livelihoods. So being well aware of what those risks are is, is key. Alana says the pristine marine environment known to locals as the Moana is tied to their ancient ways of living. Our ocean is, you know, so much in tune with our livelihoods and our culture as being a Cook Islander. Um, our ancestors have relied on our moana um, for food, so it is, you know, embedded in us as Cook Island people to be custodians for our ocean, um, guardians of our ocean, so that, you know, our ocean can also just keep giving back to us. The Cook Islands now has to decide if it's willing to risk that ocean environment in the pursuit of prosperity. Are we not already getting enough? We are getting so much from our ocean. Our ocean is providing so much for us um, in terms of our fishery resources. Fish is our staple diet uh, as Cook Islanders, as Pacific Islanders. And so for us to be almost the guinea pigs in this area, I think you know, that's something we need to be very aware of, are these risks we are willing to accept as a nation. Throughout my time here in the Cook Islands, what has been very clear is just how entwined the ocean is in every aspect of Pacific life. Right now, it's a rare occasion where some of the smallest nations on our planet are making choices with global implications. <laughs> Some of those mine sites involved um, are really quite large um, and the pollution that would be caused by it can of course affect all of us. There's nothing to suggest that seabed mining would replace land-based mining. What we might end up with is two types of mining happening in parallel with two sets of environmental damage. The decisions that are being made can have ramifications um, for decades to come. The CEO of deep sea mining company Moana Minerals Hans Smith is unfazed by the global criticism. He's spending big on his search for minerals in the Cook Islands. No, we're not worried we're not going to have a buyer. We have a particular lifestyle. Um, you know, we, we use cell phones, we use laptops, we, we want to drive our motor vehicles around. Um, and in order to do that, we need metals. Uh, and the reality is, is that if we want those metals in the quantities that we, that we need uh, in order to sustain that lifestyle, uh, we have no choice but to go into, into the ocean. After spending $50 million on research, if it comes back and says significant harm will occur from mining, do you walk away? We walk away. We walk away. That is a risk um, that we knew from the very beginning. Um, if it comes back and it says this is a no-go, we walk away. But we don't want to walk away because a minority group uh, has swayed public opinion to the point that we don't get a fair opportunity to, to prove our case. We want to be given a fair chance and a fair shake. But Jacqueline Evans says the risk to the ocean that has given life to these islands is too great. There's definitely a portion of our community that are uh, um, drunk on the idea of riches from, from mining, yeah. But the global south and uh, the Pacific, um, we haven't uh, had a good track record of extracting materials with our logging and our mining, and yet we're thinking that we're going to actually do this perfectly and that we're, we're going to succeed and there will be no environmental impact. There will be an environmental impact. Um, the question is, how bad will that impact be?